So what advice would you give to businesses as they start to try and get back to some sort of um, normal operations? Well, I think the key thing, my hospital system has 75,000 workers, for example. We have kept them, 50,000 of us have turned up for work in the last month, and we have prevented the hospital from being a site of transmission. There's a basic approach we've taken that's turned out to be a kind of combination therapy, like a drug cocktail. The four elements for us are hand hygiene, um, screening people for symptoms, masks, and social distancing at work. Each of them are imperfect, but you put them together and you get a, uh, and you get a, you're able to shut down the virus. The critical part of it is adding to a culture. And culture means being committed to the idea that we're all doing our part to avoid infecting one another. That may be the biggest question a lot, of, a lot of people have, because I think a lot of people feel that you're only as strong as the weakest link. And if you see people who aren't washing their hands, if you see people who aren't wearing their masks, that's got to make uh, people pretty nervous. How do you make sure that everyone complies? It's a, it's, it's a challenge, right? So the challenge is that our culture, our discussion in American uh, life right now is about freedom versus safety leave me alone or keep me safe. It's all about what other people need to do. We overcame this in the healthcare sector by saying, I wanna to come to work every day, never wanting to infect anybody else. I never want to cause someone else to be in the morgue. In order to build that culture, you partly have to make clear that you are the risk. We have hundreds of thousands of people who have infection. They don't know it, we spread it the, the dynamics of this virus is we spread it without knowing it. And that critical capability means that we have to be able to talk to one another, say, hey, dude, your mask isn't up, and then be, say, be able to say, thank you. This isn't about you protecting you. This is about you protecting me, and I will protect you. Doctor, it's uh, Andrew Sorkin. We were talking about this issue earlier in the last hour because we were talking about masks and I know you are a major proponent of, of masks and N95 masks, if possible. We were talking about the valve and how uh, if your mask is protecting me and my mask is supposed to protect you, that actually having a valve on it undoes that, that protection and, and makes it almost worthless. Um, how do you change the psychology? I know you're talking about the psychology issue, but there are so many people. You walk into a store even, and there have been uh, reports even over the weekend of, of almost battles that seem to be taking place inside these stores because you have customers that are wearing masks, you have customers that aren't wearing masks, you have customers not wearing masks, asking other customers to take their masks off, and people are wearing the masks telling the other people that they have to put their masks on. And, and I think that's a, this is going to be a, a, a big issue, not, and it, it can be done maybe in a workforce in a, in a closed setting, but in this larger setting it becomes even more complicated. Yeah, two things to understand. First of all, the numbers seem to indicate that you don't have to be perfect. If we can get over 60% of us wearing masks that are 60% effective, and if you have a double layer cotton mask that's well fitting, that's at least 60% effective. If we do that, we can shut down the virus. It's all about most, you know, the vast majority of us constantly getting better at putting these pieces together. Yes, there are gonna be people who, you know, don't wanna wear their masks, just like they don't necessarily wanna get their vaccinations. But above a certain level, and it doesn't have to be perfect, we can create the change. That is about a culture that, um, that we can all say to each other, hey man, can you protect me? And then, you know, if someone wants to be confrontational about it, you back off, but we are all learning. And, you know, I'm impressed walking around on the streets People are wearing masks. It's different from community to community. The ones that are gonna see the burst of infections, guess what, they're going to change. So this is about us learning, not, not about going, becoming vigilantes with each other, but about building a way that we are actively interested in preventing infecting one another, infecting our parents, infecting um, uh, anybody who could, who could really die from this. Doctor, how long do you think before we'll understand if um, things are going to be okay as we come out of it? Do we need to look two to three weeks to see as people start to open up and businesses uh, start to come back? Do you need to look four or five, six weeks down the road? When will we know if, okay, it looks like things are really okay at this point and it's safe to come back out? 
we don't have a great leading indicator, right? The, 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 the frustration about the coronavirus is that as we open up, it's going to be two weeks until we see the cases emerge, the spike in the tests, and then another two weeks till we see the hospitalizations turn out. However, um, the, you know, the best signs, one of the critical components of this is um, looking for whether people have symptoms. And it's really important that we all understand you could have what seems like a cold. It could be sniffles, and you got to stay home. Um, I've been totally fascinated by the internet thermometers. There's a one company called Kinza, and if you go to their website, you can track where fevers are emerging, and that's a very early indicator. You know where people are starting to have symptoms. We need to in our workplaces, and also when you go out in the public, be checking with each other and take seriously. You know, have you had a fever today? Have you had a sore throat? Have you even had a new runny nose? Those are turning out to be indicators that two, three, four days later you get worse and you have the uh, and you have the disease. So you want to stay home, and those are early indicators for a business as well. Do you you got to ask people every day, and if you start seeing that the number of people who are creeping up with having the symptoms, if those are climbing, that's an indicator that you may well have a problem. So, Doctor, just in, in some of the notes and in, in, uh, in anticipation of you coming on, I was surprised that one of them says uh, that person to person with droplets is probably the, the, the way it, it usually happens, and that environmental transfer is only, only 6%. And I'm wondering wh- wh- when did that become the, the thinking? And if, let's say someone that has it sneezes in the, in the grocery store. So those droplets that could be all over the place, those aren't likely to result in a spread to to someone that picks something up? That's right. In the last three weeks or so, the measures of what environmental transmission can be from surfaces and things like that seems to be low, as low as 6%. You know, it's it's not a precise number, but it's clear. The majority is airborne. Um, Social distancing is important. Most of it is prevented by staying six feet away from one another. When you sneeze, cough, talk, breathe, you are putting out respiratory droplets. Six feet isn't like a viral law. There isn't a stop sign that viruses can't go beyond that. Um, Sneezing is the worst. It can uh, um, spread well past six feet to 10 feet, 15 feet. If you're at the peak moment of infectivity, we all heard about the choir case in uh, Skagit Valley uh, Corral in Washington State, where one person who was infected ended up infecting an entire corral. Uh, More than 45 out of 60 people um, uh, got infected in an hour long practice, right? Uh, An hour long, uh, a little over an hour of practice. Um, So the core of it is that we know that um, the droplets tend to stop uh, within uh, within that six feet, but you want to wear the mask because that okay. helps stop your droplets from spreading. I hope we can uh, extend the interview a little, Doctor. I had one other question, and that is, let's say someone uh, gets uh, antibody testing and, and they have what a fairly faint line but shows that they were definitely exposed. Was there a time in there when they had been exposed when they were absolutely contagious, if they were completely asymptomatic and now have antibodies, was there a time when they could have passed it on, or is it possible that they were, they were not only asymptomatic but didn't have enough viral load to ever be contagious? Do, you, do, you, do we know? Yeah, so um, very likely the people who, have, who are testing positive for antibodies had active disease. Um, we know that uh, there are some people who never became symptomatic, and we're still trying to understand how many of those people there are, and whether they were passing infection while they had never know. developed any symptoms. Okay. However, at, at present, we do, you know, we do know before you develop your symptoms, before you develop cough and all those things, at least two days before, you are at the peak of infection and ability, yes. infectivity and ability to spread. Yeah, but if so you it's important it that we recognize. But, but if, um, if you didn't get, but if you didn't time. go from the pre to where you you exhibit symptoms, does that mean that you were contagious then? You, uh, at present, we don't know. Okay. So two examples: most kids who get infected uh, have the same viral load. It looks like 
as adults, but never, um, never develop symptoms. That's most kids. We don't know how much they are, how significant they are as silent carriers who can infect others. Um, that is still to be understood. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Gawande, you recently took the role of chairman at Haven uh, uh, rather than the CEO role. Of course, Haven, for those who don't know, is the, uh, the operation between uh, Berkshire Hathaway, J.P. Morgan, and Amazon to try and tackle what's happening in the healthcare system. Why did you take that chairman role, and how are things going at, at Haven right now? Well, I'm delighted to be able to uh, take this role, which allows me to focus on strategy, also be externally active, including on, on COVID-19. And we're focused on our million, uh, more than a million workers and their families for better costs, better outcomes, um, and uh, better experience of care. We have a number of tests and uh, strategies underway. We're evaluating them now. Uh, it's turning, it's, it's the effort to turn a Titanic of, of a healthcare system. And we're making good progress and uh, we'll be reporting out on what we learn as we go along.